I know what you're thinking. Three episodes into this Overlooked Writers series and only now am I doing an episode based on my favourite period of the show? You shouldn't spend your best video ideas immediately, you know. Henry Lincoln and Mervyn Hazeman. Henry Lincoln and Mervyn Hazeman officially collaborated on two scripts for the classic run of Doctor Who, both of them for Patrick Troughton's tenure as the second Doctor. The Abominable Snowmen was the first of the two, released as the second story of season 5 in 1967, under the producership of Innes Lloyd, and its sequel, The Web of Fear, was their other script, screening in 1968 as the fifth story of the same season, but this time overseen by producer Peter Bryant. So, as a self-confessed Troughton era fanboy, it's time for me to endlessly gush about these beauties and to go into more detail about how Henry Lincoln and Mervyn Hazeman deserve way more credit for their character work. You see, here's something that I feel goes really overlooked about these two adventures. They're both surprisingly personal affairs for the Doctor. You see, a lot of Doctor Who, well, classic Who anyway, is a case of the Doctor getting embroiled in situations and conflicts that don't personally relate to him, but he still swoops in and helps anyway because he's just that much of an upstanding guy. But it's always interesting when certain incarnations face a threat or even a recurring nemesis whose wrongdoings touch a nerve for the Doctor personally, or they go out of their way to target the Doctor specifically. In The Abominable Snowman, the Doctor makes a return to Death's End Monastery, having been there once on a previous unseen adventure three centuries earlier, and he's shocked to discover that Padma Sambhavar, an old friend of his from the 17th century, is still alive in the 20th, having had his life unnaturally extended by the great intelligence possessing him and putting him through years and years of torment. That's quite an emotional plot point, and while one could make the argument that not having the context of their friendship prior to this clouds the impact, I disagree. I think it works really well in this context with the sense of religious awe and mystique of the great intelligence, and of course the actors absolutely sell it. And then in The Web of Fear, the Great Intelligence makes a return and sets a grandiose London-wide trap in the underground, specifically to lure the Doctor in for the purposes of stealing his knowledge and experience in its continued quest to gain an identity, content with leaving him as little more than a shell with a mind as empty as a newborn child. It even tries taking advantage of the Doctor's heroic nature by kidnapping Victoria and Professor Travers as insurance that he will submit to its demands and sacrifice himself for his friend's safety. It really heightens the stakes and emotional investment when the villain's dynamic with the protagonist is this targeted and intimate, and in these two cases it is done spectacularly. The Great Intelligence itself I'm a bit mixed on, because on one hand it's particularly bland, but on the other hand that is essentially the point of it. As the Doctor describes, it is a formless shapeless entity, like a cloud of mist seeking corporeality. Its flaw is its feature in a sense, and I'm not entirely sure how to feel about that. Still, the fact that it remains largely unseen and lurking for both of its stories, and the creepy whispering performances from its actors, do help to emphasise the unearthly cosmic Lovecraftian vibe it's going for. And as I said, the emphasis of how personal this creature's attacks are to the Doctor is a neat layer of character conflict that really carries the this malevolent presence. That's not to mention how impressively in-depth and compelling the supporting casts of both of these stories are. The Abominable Snowman has the cantankerous and stubborn yet endearing Professor Travers and the wholesomely sweet Tomney among its ranks, so it automatically gets a thumbs up there. But the Web of Fear utterly blows it out of the water, with not only the return of an older senile but still lovable Travers, his highly admirable and charismatic scientist daughter Anne, cowardly but still charming soldier Evans, Weasley and not so lovable journalist Chorley, and the seemingly reliable military presence of Staff Arnold, but also the introduction of a certain level-headed and respectable ally in Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart, at this point a colonel, who makes a fabulous first impression here and would go on to become a long-running staple of the show for well over 20 years. Subsequent stories later down the line would unfortunately flanderise him as a thick-headed, humorously unimpressed military man, but in this debut story he is open-minded and curious but still authoritarian, undeniably his best self. And what's more, the story is structured as a whodunit, with an anonymous traitor among the cast helping the great intelligence. All of the supporting characters are suspect, and the twists and red herrings are all expertly done. 
And of course, we must discuss the main attraction of these two adventures. The Yeti. Simultaneously adorable and intimidating as hell, they are among the best antagonists of 60s Who. Seemingly unstoppable robot servants doing the intelligence's dirty work, stalking mountainsides and spreading fungi over the London underground. They're a very ominous presence, and even though their appearance may seem goofy to an outsider, their actions more than make up for it. And it's also narratively justified in both instances anyway. Doing a Doctor Who villainous twist around the folkloric yeti is mwah, inspired. And the settings of both outings are just the cherry on top. A Tibetan monastery and the abandoned London underground, both wonderfully isolated locations that set the tone of both adventures perfectly, and both are refreshing changes of scenery which help to alleviate the common, and I dare say unfairly exaggerated, complaint that the second Doctor's era is just bases under siege all the time. So, I've spent a long time endlessly praising these two stories, but does general fandom agree? Indeed, these two stories seem to be held in pretty high regard by general fandom. On the good old 2014 Doctor Who magazine poll, listing all 241 Doctor Who stories at the time of voting, the Web of Fear secured itself very snugly at 16th place, and the Abominable Snowmen still making the top 100 at number 87. Both pretty impressive rankings, and both of them totally deserved if you ask me. The Web of Fear is one of my all-time favourite stories, just a deliciously eerie adventure with every single aspect of the writing, acting, production, etc, pulling through to give us a near flawlessly immersive piece of TV. And while not really hitting the heights of its sequel, The Abominable Snowman still certainly has tons of merit with its serene meditative tone. So, with these two utterly great stories under their belt, Henry Lincoln and Mervyn Hazeman seem to be top tier writers for Doctor Who, with compelling character work for both our protagonist as well as their own side characters, decent villains, engaging plot lines. It seems like they're incapable of writing a dud, right? Well, they did technically write one other story for the Troughton era. Airing in 1968 as the opener for the show's sixth season, The Dominators was their last contribution to Doctor Who. But as they felt unfairly treated by the production crew, and changes were made to their script which they didn't consent to, they removed their names from the project, with the pen name going to the pseudonymic Norman Ashby. I'm still considering it as part of their output anyway, because, well, it is. But... Yeah, I certainly don't blame them for wanting to remain anonymous for this one, because the gulf in quality between their other two stories and this is... Oof, it's hard to ignore. Going back to the 2014 DWM poll, The Dominators performs disastrously in overall fan consensus, as it crashed and burned eight places from the bottom of the entire list, just barely keeping its head above other universally panned entries like Underworld, Time and the Rani, and The Twin Dilemma. That's pretty shameful. And while my inner second Doctor fanboy does insist that it doesn't quite deserve to be that low, it's certainly not a story that I'd be able to make genuinely solid defences for. I think the best I could muster is, it's a fun meme and it's so bad it's funny and two and Jamie save it a bit with their cute sexy gay snuggling, ooh woo! But putting my genuine critical analysis hat on, this kinda sucks. All that praise I had earlier for Lincoln and Hazeman's character work? Yeah, it doesn't apply here. I do not remember the name of a single Dulcian or even any individual character traits. They're all just painted with the same broad stroke of, haha, see how pathetic and cowardly pacifist societies are? And while Dominators Rago and Toba are ironically amusing, there's no real depth to them in the slightest. They just butt heads all the time and come off as childish and incompetent. Dolkis as a setting isn't particularly engaging either, and oh dear lord, talk about a downgrade. These are among some of the worst robot henchmen in Doctor Who. The quarks are utterly, laughably terrible. Again, I don't consider it a true dud by any means. I still do get enjoyment and entertainment value out of it, purely thanks to our regulars being their good old, endlessly endearing selves. But yeah... Regardless of whatever unsolicited changes were made without their permission, Lincoln and Hazeman still kind of fell flat here. 
A dispute with the BBC over the copyright of the Quarks deterred the duo from writing for the show ever again, therefore cancelling their planned third Great Intelligence and Yeti story, The Laird of McCrimmon. Which is a real shame, because judging from its intended purpose as Jamie's last story, as well as acknowledging how great their character work was in their first two scripts, it probably would have been a gem that would have made up for the failings of the Dominators. So even though they technically disown this particular story, it's still a universally disliked entry on their part that may contribute to the reasons why these otherwise two great writers aren't celebrated more often by fandom. Another factor to consider isn't anything to do with the quality of their writing, but rather the archival state of their other two entries. A significant amount of 60s Who no longer exists in a visual state, due to BBC junking practices of the 70s, and both The Abominable Snowmen and The Web of Fear have been affected by this. Of all six parts of The Abominable Snowmen, only episode two remains intact, and the equally as long Web of Fear remained almost completely missing for decades until foreign copies of all but episode three were found and returned to the BBC archives in the early 2010s. The two stories can still be fully experienced in some fashion, thanks to all missing episodes surviving in audio form, but not all of fandom is particularly capable or keen on experiencing entertainment in this format, perhaps making Lincoln and Hazeman's legacy seem more obscure, despite the overall glowing reputation of these outings from those in the know. Though who knows? With the Web of Fear receiving an animation for the absent episode 3, and rumours of the Abominable Snowmen receiving similar treatment relatively soon, or the very, very slim possibility that the original footage will turn up someday. Maybe that will turn around, and these two writers will be more recognised for their output. Only time will tell. I love this story so much.